Hello, BookTube. I have some mail for you today on a sunny day in mid-December. <laughs> Just a beautiful day for going out on walks with the with the tiny little bee. Is, can you make her out? She is. She is. We're going to be able to. There she is. <laughs> she is. She got tired of nudging me and kicking me and decided to just sort of sleep, sort of go to sleep. Uh, we'll start with a couple of periodicals. We've got a couple of great periodicals. Of course, we're reaching that that dolorous time of year for me. Probably the rest of you do this in a lot of a in much better, more efficient way. But I'm reaching that time of year where the stack of junk mail, the solicitations and the bills and the whatnot much like Ron Paul of the Bailey I lay them down to mature for a while I don't I don't jump right on them so if it's an important piece of mail a checky poo for instance or something like that I'll open it right away but otherwise there's a pile that I just steadily build on <laughs> I just steadily add things to it and I am reaching that point probably tomorrow when I need to go through that pile and reduce it to zero which means that I need to address everything that's in there that needs addressing, and I also need to write out a little snowfall full of checks <laughs> to renew periodical subscriptions, probably a lot of which have, have lapsed, although maybe not because I tend to wait until now to do it, so all of them would be dated from now. I need to just, to just send out a bunch of subscriptions tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, but two periodicals that I... I am still getting. <laughs> I hope that I hope that more will come. One is the New Yorker. Uh, I guess that's a tree with lights on it in front of a lighted window. This had uh, a letter that I found really interesting. It jogged a lot of memories for me. I wonder how many of you, statistically speaking, demographically, I wish I could check how how old my average viewer is. But I bet a lot of you remember Y two K. I bet a lot of you do. Uh, which, for those of you who, are, who were born in the 21st century, you won't remember that. It was a worry that everyone had leading up to New Year's, the changing of the year to the year 2000. Because every, uh, the automated calendar of every computer system in the world had been calibrated for 19 dot dot. And if suddenly that's not there, will they all reset in catastrophic ways? We all worried about it, and uh, it even gets a mention on Star Trek Voyager, and it has since become, well, let me read the letter, because the letter writer, the letter, the letter is writing from Elgin, Illinois, and makes a very good point about how that, the Y2K scare has come to take a certain kind of, it's taken on a certain kind of character in our popular parlance that is wrong. Uh, I, I was very happy to see this letter. Uh, I enjoyed Thomas Mallon's review of Tobias Becker's book about nostalgia. But like Zadie Smith's piece of memoir that appears in the same issue, Mallon's article features a misleading reference to Y2K. Mallon calls Y2K a, quote, passing apocalyptic fancy. Indeed, in the past 24 years, Y2K has become a stand-in for any such hype threat that turns out to be insignificant. In reality, however, Y2K is a rare example of a known problem that was successfully addressed in advance through the combined efforts of government and private industry. I am one of the many programmers who worked on Y2K preparation. Like my colleagues, I waited at home on New Year's Eve 1999, watching anxiously and then triumphantly as the lights stayed on in country after country while the clocks across the globe struck midnight. These efforts could have been turned into an example of how to coordinate catastrophic pre uh, prevention if they hadn't been so successful that the general public now believes the threat didn't exist at all. <laughs> That's uh, that's extremely well put. Uh, I don't know. I'm hoping that the writer is not referring by with catastrophic prevent present preventation to uh, the coronavirus pandemic, although maybe the author is. Maybe the letter writer is referring to the coronavirus. Certainly, uh, <laughs> well, I don't. I don't want to get all uh, all controversial on you, but certainly having indiscriminate wet markets a couple of blocks away from the Wuhan Institute of Virology that's dealing with gain-of-function research on, on novel coronaviruses. <laughs> Probably not a good combination, but who could have seen it coming? So The New Yorker. Uh, and then we have another issue, the TLS. Sometimes my TLS is just bunch up, and, and I get a couple in a row. I get a couple on a couple of different days. And much like the last TLS, the last TLS, the one we dealt, we dealt with just the other day, uh had the the collected letters of Seamus Heaney. 
big, fat, almost a thousand pages of a big volume of the Collector's Letters of Seamus Heaney, which they gave a, an elaborate review. And I immediately want the book. <laughs> I want a copy of the book. And in that video, I said two things. One, I mentioned that had I wanted a UK publication in years past, I would have gone to Book Depository and ordered a copy there. But the Book Depository doesn't exist anymore. What is a good alternative to Book Depository? And I, I also said in that video that I really doubted that the, the collected letters of Seamus Heaney would get an American publication. And about the second one, uh, Hannah at Hannah's Books reminded me that Heaney was on the faculty, an honored position at the faculty of Harvard University Press, of Harvard University, for a long, long time. And Harvard University Press doesn't have to worry about name recognition, it doesn't have to worry about marketability. It's got a, something like a north of two and a two and a half billion dollar endowment, so they can they can print whatever they want. Of course, what, the minute she said that, I realized, oh, that is absolutely true. Harvard University Press, at least, if nobody else does, they could bring out this volume in America, and certainly will. And the other thing was that a lot of you emailed me. I, when I put questions, I leave my email in every video, and I do it specifically because I view this as a conversation. Uh, despite the awe-inspiring intimidation factor of the sexy influencer aspect of the parasocial relationship, you are still allowed to correspond with me. <laughs> Free. <laughs> so I put it to a question. I got a lot of responses, and I have to say, far and away the winner in terms of number was Blackwell's. Just order books from Blackwell's. I, I checked it out, and I think I'm going to add them to my bookmarks bar of my desktop for Google Chrome, <laughs> because uh, they ship all over the world. Their shipping is free, and they have uh, deals. You buy two, get one three, all that sort of stuff. They have deals like that all the time, and a large, large listing. They have a very good, very attentive website, so that, that was solved as well. Uh, so I may yet see the collected letters of Seamus Heaney in an American publication. Certainly, if it's Harvard University Press, I will see it. Uh, but that was a letter collection that was one of the first things I saw on that TLS that I wanted. And the same thing happened with this one. This is also, this is from Oxford University Press. So it's possible that I could get a copy of this, even if it doesn't come out in America. And it is the uh, the collected letters of of... Poor, dumb, beautiful Wilfred Owen. <laughs> this is this is half the length. This is like 600 pages long? 500 pages long. Uh, I still want it. Very much so. Uh, 2023 has done a large amount to, re, to make me fall in love all over again with collected letters, with the art of collected letters. Partly because I've read a whole bunch of great ones, read them or reread them in 2023, but also because 2023, with every one of those letter collections that I read, I, the reality was further underscored that we aren't going to see, that that is a kind of writing that is going to die. We aren't going to see the collected emails of anyone. <laughs> so, because they, first of all, who keeps them? And second, there's an, an open question of whether or not uh, well, you name it, Martha Wells. Or pick pick some some you know dewy twenty two year old ingenue who has a fifty million dollar book advance to write uh, the book version of their Twitter feed. There's an open question as to whether or not they even own their correspondence. I don't know for one hundred percent certain that I do. When I when Google updates its terms, like everybody else, I scroll to the bottom and check accept. <laughs> I don't read through the terms. It's entirely possible that Google owns my emails. So it either, even if it doesn't, you're still not going to get anything like what you have now. So I, I, if, if I'm going to get a lot of letter collections in 2024, well, it'd be nice to start off with Wilfred Owen. So sooner or later, I'm going to go to Blackwell's and make a test purchase. Probably won't be a brand new hardcover. It'll probably be, you know, in, in, a pretty paperback that is UK only from their back stock. And that test will be to see uh, how much information I need to give them. It'll be to see what their shipping is like. Uh, the, their website says that everything is packed very carefully, conscientiously. We shall see. I'll do a test run before I start becoming a regular customer of theirs. Uh, so those are the two periodicals. There was the New Yorker that reminds us that Y2K was a threat. If people hadn't worked on it ahead of time, it might have crippled computer systems all over the world, including the ones that govern the launch of thermonuclear weapons. Uh, and also, uh, 
before I got any further in this in this TLS, uh, there's another letters collection that I want. Wilfred Owen, a Wilfred Owen letters collection. Now we have uh, the mail. And we don't have any Manila this time around. We just have cardboard. <laughs> two cardboard envelopes and two little boxes. I'm still anticipating that everything here will be 2024. I really, I really don't think, <laughs> I really don't think I'm going to get any uh, 2023 releases anymore. I don't know what they'd be if they were. Uh, so let's see what this first one is. Yeah, okay. All right, this comes out January, February, March, April. This comes out in May. And this is by Carolyn Alexander who did uh, Endurance, that a lot of you will know. This is her new book, uh, Skies of Thunder, the deadly World War II mission over the roof of the world. So she is back to the Arctic. I don't have uh, any kind of paperwork on this. Uh, so let's see here. Let's just read it as if we were in a bookstore together. Uh, in April of 1942, the Imperial Japanese Army steamrolled through Burma, capturing the only ground route from India to China. Supplies to this critical zone would now have to come from India by air, meaning across the Himalayas, on the most hazardous air route in the world. Skies of Thunder is the story of epic human endeavor, one in which Allied troops face the monumental challenges of operating from airfields hacked from the jungle and taking on the hump, the fearsome mountain barrier that defined the air route. They flew fickle, untested aircraft through monsoons and enemy fire with inaccurate maps and only primitive navigation technology. The result was a litany of both deadly crashes and astonishing feats of survival. The most chaotic of all the war's arenas, the China-Burma-India theater, was further confused by the conflicting political interests of Roosevelt, Churchill, and their demanding nominal ally, Chiang Kai-shek. Sounds fantastic. That sounds just fantastic. Now, several of you also commented, yes, okay, some of you also commented on yesterday's videos that since my light source is coming from my right, Maybe don't put books here because you'll cast your face into shadow like Captain Kirk on the old Star Trek show. That does work a lot better, doesn't it? I'll, I'll eventually get good at this booktubing thing. Uh, so, Skies of Thunder, Carolyn Alexander, she's a well-known quantity to most of you. You don't need much in the way of, uh, of urging. Okay, what is this next one? Uh, okay. Uh, so just a just a receipt with this, or an invoice. Uh, okay, this is a this is a reprint. It's a lovely thing. Uh, I wonder what what's going on here. Uh, this is by Christopher Gosha, who's a history professor in Montreal, and this is his one volume history of Vietnam. And what I'm taking to be a beautiful, this, look at this, a beautiful trade paperback. Look at how lovely that is. And also, you've got the, the greenery inside the letters on the spine. That is just lovely. The folks at Basic Burks, I swear, they are on a, oh, sorry, <laughs> they're on a roll. They really are for their books. But uh, the pub sheet is telling me, or the, the uh, indicia is telling me here that this was published originally in 2016. And I remember it. Uh, so I don't know what this is. I'll have to look in. I'll have to look into this and see why I'm getting this. Uh, a new, obviously, a new paperback reprint. This is going to be twenty-three dollars. Probably it's out already. Uh, I'll, I'll have to check and see if if there's anything. Uh, is this, maybe you're going to tell me if there's anything different about this one. In this book, the author tells the full history of Vietnam from antiquity to the present day. Generations of emperors, rebels, priests, and colonizers left complicated legacies in this remarkable country. Periods of Chinese, French, and Japanese rule reshaped and modernized Vietnam, and so too did the colonial enterprises of the Vietnamese themselves, as they extended their influence southward from the Red River Delta. A major achievement, this book gives readers a grand narrative of the country's complex past and the creation of the modern state of Vietnam. It is essential reading for anyone seeking to understand Vietnam today. Uh, okay, I don't know why I'm getting this. No mention is made here of this having anything new. Maybe basic just Wanted to reprint it. Fine by me. <laughs> that ought to happen a lot more often. Fine by me. Uh, I don't, off the top of my head, remember if I reviewed this, but I remember reading it. I remember liking it. Uh, and of course, I've been to Vietnam many times. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on to the boxes. We have two boxes, and then we'll be done. Uh, mail for today. No idea if that uh, Vietnam book actually spoils the streak. It could be a 2023 release. 
Uh, so what is this? What's this next one? Uh, okay. This is the mathematical radio inside the magic of AM, FM, and single sideband uh, by Paul Nahin. The mathematical radio. So this comes out in Jan oh, January 16th. This comes out in late January. The modern radio is a wonder. And behind that magic is mathematics. Huh, you had to go and ruin it. <laughs> in this book, the author explains how radios work, deploys mathematics and historical discussion, accompanied by a steady stream of intriguing puzzles for math buffs to ponder. Oh my God. Oh my God. Beginning with oscillation and circuits, then moving on to AM, FM, and single sideband radio, the author focuses on the elegant mathematics underlying radio technology rather than the engineering. He explores and explains more than a century of key developments, placing them in historical and technological context. Math and I don't get along. Am I going to get along with this book? How well are you going to explain this? Don't tell me this has math in it. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, it does. It's full of math. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I love the folks at Princeton, so I'm on for this. I'm on for the ride, but still. Uh, the author is a prolific is a prolific author of books on math for the general reader, describing in and here he describes in fascinating detail the mathematical underpinnings of a technology we use daily. Do we use do you use radio technology daily? Do you? Uh, maybe you do. Um, who is this author? He's an emeritus professor of electrical engineering at the University of New Hampshire, and he has written a gigantic swack of books about technology and math. <laughs> okay, all right, uh, great. I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. I just, I don't know how much of it's going to get to me. <laughs> I don't know how much of it's going to work. Uh, never thought I'd be in the mood to get a Habsburg book, but <laughs> now I am. Uh, let's see, let's make sure we have all this out of control. Uh, oh, okay, all right, much better. <laughs> much closer to Steve Metier. What have we got here? Uh, January. Okay, so we have we have three books at least that are coming out next year, and then maybe the Vietnam book is as well. So this comes out in uh, in late January, and this is this is by David Bellos and Alexandre Martin Montague, and it is called "Who Owns This Sentence: A History of Copyrights and Wrongs." <laughs> oh my. Okay, it's no secret that copyright is everywhere. Uh, controlling and monetizing nearly every aspect of the world around us. You might think you're not connected to it, but if you make booktube videos, you make YouTube videos of any kind, you are intimately connected with copyright. It can nuke your channel. Playing fast and loose with it can nuke your channel. In a, in a case like this, this channel, where there's no filters, there's no B-roll, there's no stock footage, there's no uh, music, there's no editorial stuff of any kind, and I'm only reading you stuff that's in a pub sheet designed to be read, <laughs> to be read aloud, to be shared with people, there are no issues here. But plenty of YouTubers, oh my god, it's the first thing they think about in the morning and the last thing they think about before they go to bed. Uh, at this very moment, battles are raging over copyright in an in the output of artificial intelligence programs. Everything from books to pop songs to the reproduction rights to photographs of your dining table are now deemed to be intellectual properties, making copyright a labyrinthine construction of laws and rationales that can be baffling to try to understand. Very shortly after the beginning of 2025, all of that is going to be simplified quite a bit. Uh, in this book, the authors break down the complicated world of copyright to offer readers a cultural, legal, and global history of the idea that, intang uh, that intangible things can be owned. Copyright evolved from a long tangle of high ideals, low greed, opportunism, and word mangling that eventually allowed works of literature and poetry, and now even ringtones and databases, to be treated as if they were no different from tangible property like farms and houses. They are tangible property. <laughs> they are. Uh, the authors begin in 18th century London, where copyright was first established to limit printers' control of books. Arguments against copyright arose from the start and nearby, nearly abolished copyright in the 19th century. In the late 20th century, a handful of little-noticed changes brought about a new enclosure of the cultural commons, concentrating ownership of immaterial goods in very few hands. 
Despite its countless revisions over the centuries, copyright has emerged stronger than ever. This is the finished copy. I am going to let my fingers do the walking here. I want to look for one name. I'm sure this is this will be a thorough book. I'm going to look for one name. Uh, and it's not in here. Okay, maybe you folded it into... Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Henry Field's name is not in here. Uh, okay. All right, well, okay. What, what about... What about Boston? Boston is not mentioned in this book. Well, some reviews just write themselves, don't they? <laughs> All right. Uh, who is the most powerful, the deepest pockets? Who's the most powerful guarantor of copyright in the world? It's the United States, most powerful and then fill in the blank, it's going to be the United States. It's copyright. Who, where are the most copyright lawyers? The United States. Where is the most copyright legislation? The United States. Where is the most copyright legislation with teeth in other countries? The United States. Where did all that start? Where did all that start? Did it start with London printers? Or did it start in the Boston book trade? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. <laughs> That's okay. Well, all right. <laughs> I will read the book. Uh, if I'm back, I will read the book. Uh, so there you go. Uh, that's the mail. Uh, I don't know what kind of a mental safari this was. There's who owns this sentence. Copyright for authors, for poets and essayists and novelists, had its birth in Boston, which means Boston deserves a mention in the index of this book. It was largely the brainchild of one man who fought for it with the fierceness of an African lion. Had he not done that, it's entirely possible that certain literary fortunes that are worth millions today would be worth nothing. They'd be owned by their publisher. <laughs> that is not me being what one old friend of mine referred to as a homer. That is not me just saying everything started in Boston. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we also have the mathematical radio. So this is going to be about the wonders of FM and AM radio, but it's all about the math. It's all about the math involved in the circuitry. Oh, I'm going to trust that the author actually can teach me this stuff and is not expecting me to know. Then the skies of thunder over the Burma route uh, in World War II. Oh, my. So you, like, for instance, you aviation buffs, those of you who, who really like, for instance, Ernest Gahn's book, Fate is the Hunter, this is right up your alley. This is right up your alley. And finally, uh, this really lovely hand-sized trade paperback reprint of a one-volume history of Vietnam, which is the, the pressing question of this mail hall. I actually don't know. Oh, should this be over here? I actually don't know what that is. I'll have to look it up and see what the reason is. Actually, I don't, I won't bother to look it up. I'll just email the publicist and ask, you know, what's going on here? What should I know that I don't know about this? And is it out in bookstores already? Uh, but there you go. There's the mail plus periodicals including uh, yet another mention of a UK book. Now, Hannah was, was quick off the mark to, to uh, give me some hope that the collected letters of Seamus Heaney could see print in the United States, almost certainly will see print in the United States. I don't think even she will be that quick to talk about the collected letters of Wilfred Owen. Mm, <laughs> it's possible not. It's possible that won't see print in America. So maybe first Blackwell's purchase? Uh, certainly that is the lead contender for Steve's UK purchases. Every once in a while I give myself a treat of a UK book, uh, especially if I think it's not going to come out in America. So is this Blackwell's work for you? That was by far the lead contender of suggestions, but what about the rest of you, people who didn't pipe up? Do you want to pipe up now? Do you ever, any of you use Blackwell's? Any of you, any of you in the UK actually shop in person at Blackwell's? Oh my. <laughs> Would that be enviable? Uh, but anyway, that's the mail. For today, uh, I'm going to wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.